Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, today we have uh, uh, this event about uh, glaucoma management. Uh, we have with us uh, Professor uh, uh, Shakil Sharif uh, and Professor Ahmed Salah. And suppose that Professor Muhammad Al Malah will join us. Uh, our guest speaker uh, tonight is uh, Dr. Shakil Sharif was uh, graduated from New York Medical College. He had training in New York Medical College also and in Washington University School of Medicine. He has now the position of professor and director of glaucoma service, Case Western Reserve University, uh, University School of Medicine, Cleveland. Uh, Dr. Shaquille has got uh, many hours uh, the last one, uh, last year, the achievement or from the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Uh, Dr. Shakir, uh, Dr. Shakir will uh, today will uh, talk about uh, post-operative tube management and uh, minimally invasive yet maximally uh, destructive, and also uh, he will talk about the surgical management of acute angle closure glaucoma. Uh, the first talk will be about the tube management, post-operative tube management. Dr. Shakil. Dr. Magdi, Dr. Ahmed, now can, uh, can speak freely. Uh, 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 Dr. Shakil, uh, it's nice to meet you. Thank you. In our gathering. And uh, Ramadan Karim. To you as well. Uh, yes, I know the time at you in the United States now is uh, about 3.3. 3. I know you, you are fasting. So <laughs> we can no, have no longer time. I'd like to present uh, with uh, us the superstar, Dr. Shaquille Sharif, Professor and Director of Glaucoma Service, University Eye Hospital Eye Institute, uh, Oklahoma, uh, United States. I've also my deep gratitude to my Professor uh, Dr. Magdi Khalaf for preparing this uh, gathering together. Uh, we hope to enjoy our meeting and uh, I asking now uh, Professor Shakir to represent the first item of uh, management of eleva elevated IOP following shunt surgery. Please we have five minutes after each presentation to ask for any question and please any audience or viewer of us any question have to be written to be asked for to Shakir. Okay go on to Shakir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. I appreciate uh, the invitation. Um, I hope everyone's safe in Egypt uh, as we are, are obviously uh, dealing with the, uh, the COVID uh, virus here, here over 1 million people in the United States. I was asked to discuss a few uh, challenging surgical cases and so I wanted to start with the first one. Uh, it'll be interactive, so if, if uh, any of the five um, um, professors want to chime in, I, you're welcome to uh, um, speak. Um, so this is about post-op management of uh, elevated pressure following uh, tube shunt surgery. Um, and this is a, a hopefully a good overview for the, uh, the viewers of how to manage someone in this uh, situation. So this is basically a 68-year-old um, a uh, 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 male who presented with the pressure that was very high, 39, and uh, no medications. He was a very active uh, outdoor sportsman. He was taking uh, three glaucoma medications, one of them was combined. And his uh, anterior segment examination was uh, pertinent for a um, good vision, but he had an afferent pupillary defect in the left eye. Um, on glare, he had uh, a, a suggestion of a cataract in that eye. He had pseudoexfoliation in the left eye, and he had total uh, nerve damage in the left eye and visual field loss as well. And because he's a very active uh, sports person, we decided to do a cataract with tube shunt but I was concerned if we do a trabeculectomy, uh, this would be a problem um, as he, he spends a lot of time outdoors. But this is, this is a, a surgical outcome. He has what appears to be very poor vision, hand motion. Um, he has a pressure of 35, and you can see he says blood in his uh, tube, as well as uh, clumps of blood here as well. And you can see the Corneal light reflux is not very clear here. The, the border, sorry. And you can see that uh, more clearly here, the blood in the tube. Um, he basically, uh, it, with massage, there was no change uh, in his uh, 
uh, uh, presentation. Um, the, uh, so at this juncture, the question I ask the audience uh, and, and the five uh, doctors here is how would you proceed at this point? What would you want to do at this point? Any of want to comment before we yes. move on? Yes. Yeah, what would you do at this point? He is uh, pressure is very high. He has blood in the tube in the chamber. What yes. would be the next step? Yes. The first, we ask ourselves why the the tension high even with the presence of shunt. Correct. And after how many days the uh, the IOP yeah. will elevate? No, the this was just day eight. This was day eight. Day eight. Yes. And the the what about what about the previous seven, seven days? Is the, the tension normal or within normal? Yeah, the tension was normal, but now at day eight, he presents with a blurred vision. The surgery was uneventful. He does not have uh, diabetes or any uh, yes. uh, vascular glaucoma. He does not yes, have that. But, but I, even with the blood clot inside the anterior chamber, I noticed there is a remnant of blood inside the, inside the tube itself. Could be, uh, could be this, uh, oh, yeah, uh, including the tube chunk. Yes, correct. That's one option. So the question is, what would you do next at this point? Yes. To manage this patient? The chunk uh, is already closed. So you have to reopen it, uh, it and uh, remove the tube and re can look at, reform it, it and reopen it to, the, to, to make patency and to the, more make the IOP to be lower than that. Right. So, what can we do uh, in uh, to to achieve that? Okay, we are waiting for the order answer. <laughs> <laughs> I can keep going. I'm just trying to make it interactive. Actually, uh, Dr. Shakil, uh, as you know, I'm a refractive surgeon. My rule is only to uh, introduce you, and then uh, I will let you uh, <laughs> let you uh, discuss together uh, you and Dr. Salah and Dr. Malah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Point the question is how would you proceed? Uh, you are enjoying the presence with, with us. <laughs> yeah, yes. So, but your point was well made. You want to do something to remove the blood, and so at this point we have to think about you know tissue plasminogen activator TPA. Yes. And, and just a brief uh, uh, background here because I know the time is limited. Is basically a naturally occurring protease that in the unbound state has a systemic half life just under five minutes. But what's unique about this particular uh, protease is that once it binds to the clot, as, as the clot in the tube, it can break down the fibrin um, and last for more than seven hours, which is quite yes. impressive. Um, yes. And so the, the nice thing is it has a localized effect to the side of the thrombus formation. And once the TPA binds uh, to the clot and interacts with plasminogen, it makes this uh, uh, activated to plasmin which then breaks down this clot and then again, it's uh, safe to use. Um, in terms of the eye, uh, it averts the need for more surgery. I don't want to take this man back to the operating room if I don't have to, you know. Uh, there's no reported corneal toxicity uh, with, with the TPA for a dose less than 25 micrograms. And it can restore the flow uh, through the tube with a rapid decrease in pressure and prevent further optic nerve damage. And also it has a localized effect, which makes it very nice because you will not cause any systemic bleeding. So this is a uh, report from Alan Zalta, a major paper. They looked at 620 eyes, um, a majority of which were Ahmed shunts, and they looked at all those that had tube obstruction. They found 36 of them. And they found that if you give a dose of 15 micrograms into the anterior chamber, uh, they can dissolve the clot in over 90% of patients, majority of them just required one dose. Some of them required more than one dose, as noted over here. And the drop in pressure was almost 21 millimeters of mercury. Um, the complications were primarily limited to uh, hypotony and hyphema. And the main diagnoses in terms of blood was neovascular glaucoma or inflammatory glaucoma. And the source of the uh, tube occlusion was fibrin due to an altered blood aqueous barrier or blood due to rubiosis. So this is just a, a background here. So going back to our patient, what Alan Zalta did was he would inject the TPA just into the anterior chamber uh, yes. to dissolve the clot. But what I did differently, because when you inject the TPA here, you're going to wait for the TPA to migrate and hopefully get to the tube. But in my rationale, the, the medication will not go through the tube necessarily rapidly because there's no flow here. 
So what I've done was I'd make an incision 180 degrees opposite the tube clot and take out some aqueous and actually take a 27 gauge needle and insert the 27 short gauge needle directly into the tube and inject the TPA because I want the TPA to work directly on the clot. So the goal here is to enhance the localized effect of the TPA by injecting it directly to the site of the clot. Now, when I did that, you can see here, there's a lot of red blood cells floating in the chamber when I give a very low dose of 12.5 micrograms. And there's a small bleb that's forming, as you can notice over here. It's a low-lying bleb. So we had this patient come back in 24 hours. And you can see that in 24 hours, the tube is much clearer. However, the vision's still poor and the pressure is still elevated here at day nine. And so if you look very carefully here, there's still a clot in the distal part of the tube. Yeah. And so I decided at this point, we give another injection of TPA because I want this man's uh, surgery to work. And then we had him come back four days later and you can see now the tube is much clearer and you can see there is a formation of a bleb. But however, the vision's still poor and the pressure is still 33. And at this point, uh, when I did gonioscopy on this patient, we were able to see blood in the tube uh, distally. So we knew there was still a little bit of clot left. So I decided at this point that we'll give one more injection, the highest dose you can give without causing uh, corneal toxicity of 25 micrograms. And then he comes back at the two-week post-op period. Now the pressure is 44. So what do you want to do at this point? Can I share this with Shakil? Assalamu alaikum. Islam, yes. For my opinion, I, 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 from the start, uh, actually we have uh, a treatment here in, in Egypt. So if I have the same situation, uh, I go to uh, uh, explore the valve and bring the tube out and put the, uh, the 23 gauge needle and inject a normal slime through the tube to clear it and re-implant it. This is one of the solutions. Uh, number two, um, why uh, or if there is any chance to uh, use anti-VGF instead of tissue plasminogen, did you have any experience about that? Uh, I know the reports are out there, but I did not have that um, available to me at the time. This back, this case was from 2015, so I'm just, uh, uh, yeah, that's definitely a good option. Uh, but but yes. but your 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 point is very very well taken. That if at two weeks the uh, there's still the, the the tube is not Features. working. Yes, it's very high. Explore. Yes. We should, we should explore the tube and yes. clean it yes. outside and yeah, replant it again. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's do that. It was one my opinion from the first storm I left. Yeah, so here is the assessment of the, so my concern is mechanical valve failure, right? So I took the patient to the operating room and I basically like putting in uh, two sutures here because I'd like to infraduct the eye to get a good, uh, you know, um, um, exposure of the area. I always had to put two in. So you can see there's a very low lying bleb here, but and the tube is clear here. You see it's clear in the chamber. Yes. I'm yes. going to inject with some balance, um, with some uh, lidocaine with epinephrine uh, to balloon up the area. And I'm going to open up this uh, conjunctiva. And the objective here, as you have said very beautifully, is to unroof the patch graft and to take to exteriorize and explant the tube. And I'm going to try to uh, flush it to see if there's resistance to um, uh, outflow. And if it is, at that point, you know, one can consider doing an exchange with a new, new tube shot. But when you pull it out here, you can take a look here. There's a very long column of blood that is present in the tube. Yes. Notice yes. that the anterior chamber part is very clear, which we, we saw in the office. But this is hidden underneath the patch graph. Look how long this column is. I've never seen this before. So at this point, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to squeegee and, and remove this blood away from the valve's mechanism because I don't want it to, to uh, destroy the valves. And you can see once it's taken out, you can see the blood here removed. And at this point, I'm going to now try to flush with balanced saline solution. If, if uh, there is resistance, and we know there's a mechanical problem. But look how smooth the, the fluid comes out very nicely. Um, if we assess with a Q-tip, you can see a rapid uptake uh, and absorption by the Q-tip indicating that this is a functioning valve. We don't need to do a, uh, a tube plant exchange. And look at this uh, tripan yes. blue. Yes. Very nice uh, you know, flow here. But, those, but, but uh, the take home message in this um, um, case is, I'm gonna give you a summary of all the things you need to think about when we have high pressure following implantation. So for sake of time, I'm going to move forward here a little bit and you can see 
um, that uh, this patient um, on uh, the next day, look how beautiful that tube is. Very clear. The yes. chamber is very clear. Look at this beautiful blood here, very diffuse. And you can see that his um, um, uh, pressure was five. The vision improved to 20, 50. Um, and you can see the diffuse blood, so indicating that this was fine all along. So probably during the time of implantation, the tube may have hit a blood supply somewhere in the angle that caused the, the micro bleed. This is now seven and a half weeks after the clot removal. Look how clear the corneal light reflex is. Yes. You know that the pressure is not yes. elevated. The tube is clear. And look yes. at the very 2025. Yes. The pressure is 18. And yes. very nice corneal light reflex. And here is his uh, uh, presence of his bleb. You can see that he's got a very nice diffuse blood that's raised. He's happy. His vision is good. His pressure is a lot more acceptable at 18 compared to uh, 39 on no meds. So yes. my take home message in this particular case, and this is a summary of the whole discussion here, is that when you have a patient present with elevated uh, eye pressure following a tube shunt, how do you manage this patient? Well, in the first one to three days, if you have a flat or raised bleb, you're thinking about possible viscoelastic. I like putting viscoelastic in my elderly patients, especially because I don't want hypotony. And there you can just buy time or you could do an anterior chamber tap or try to massage the eye. If it's more than three days and it's still flat, you have to consider, at least with the Ahmed shunt, did you fail to prime the valve? That has happened to me once or twice. In that case, you have to cannulate and, and prime the valve to make it work. If it's more than three to five days, in this case, it was eight days, he came in with heme and blood. So we need to do something to does dissolve the clot or the fibrin. And so the TPA injection is what you should think about. And in this case, this person required at least four injections. It still didn't work. If at two weeks or more, it's still not working, you have to think about mechanical valve failure and do an exploratory uh, operation, which we did to flush the tube, and it worked very well. If the pressure is elevated more than three to four weeks, then you're talking about bleb and cap filiation in the hypertensive phase. And at that point, you would initiate aqueous suppressants. So this is uh, my first case, and I hope that this was uh, beneficial. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Takir. But I have two questions. Yeah. The first question for one of the, our followers or audience, what you, can you use UBM as an investigative tool to detect uh, the block, the tube, before going to shunt or re reopen it? Um, I, mean, I, I, I mean, well, clinically, not everyone may have access to a UBM, but if, if we've done the basic uh, uh, blood clot and it didn't work, you have to consider that there's a mechanical... Uh, if, if, uh, if, you don't, if you don't see any blood clot, could we, could we do UBM to... to uh, you can, I mean, that, but it won't stop me from going to the operating room. I still have to take the patient to the surgery uh, yes. to see what's going on, right? I mean, uh, we need to help the patient. Uh, the UBM will be more diagnostic, but you have to still go and, and, and evaluate the patient. Yes, yes. The second question, please, from me. What is the time interval between the first TB injection and the second one? Um, well, the first injection was on day eight. Yes. We waited, we waited 24 hours. Because remember, that if the, uh, the TPA binds to the clot, it can work up to more than seven hours. So I wanted to make sure I gave enough time for yes. that to work. So it was reasonable after 24 hours to give a second injection because it did dissolve the clot almost three-fourths of the tube. So I knew it was working. So that's why I did the uh, injections. You prefer to do more than uh, two injection TPA or just two only? Well, according to Dr. Alan Zalta's uh, work, as you see here, um, he had, uh, in terms of um, injections, let me see if I can um, find that slide here for you. Uh, that's where I, did, I based all my work on. Um, he had given more than, uh, you can see here in this table here, that yes. majority required a single dose but yes. many required more than two or more injections, 13 of them. Yes. So yes. that's the guideline that I use to do it safely uh, for this patient. Yes, okay. The last question uh, from our, our viewers is... The, the, I have a comment, the, of Rahman. Okay, 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 Dr. Mohammed. Uh, the last question from the viewers, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, the last question, we are, why are we handing the tube inside the tube chamber? Is it the length of the tube is too long or this the normal length for you? I, I'm not aware of any, uh, 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 the, the key is to make sure the tube is placed uh, parallel to the iris, away from the corneal endothelium. Um, yeah. 
So when someone rubs the eye, did the tube will go back towards the legs, not forward? I, I, I can't, of course we can make it shorter. I don't think there's any harm uh, as long as the tube is not, um, 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 uh, uh, you know, uh, blo um, uh, blocking the visual axis. Yes. Um, in terms of, I'm trying to find the picture here. Um, let me see here. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's, not, that's not unreasonable. Um, yes. I think it's fine. It could be shorter, but but the the, the take home here is about dealing with the uh, the blockage. Yes. Can I comment something, uh, Ahmed? Yes. Uh, uh, can I welcome uh, Professor Mahmoud Ismail, Professor and the head yes. of the Ophthalmology Hello. Department at Azhar University? We would like to welcome you, sir, and by the name of the Al Azhar University. Thank you for participating with us. And I was the one who was asking about the length of the, the tube inside the anterior chamber because yes. I am a cornea guy and I am afraid for the, <laughs> I'm very worried for the cornea. And if you like it to be more beveled a little bit or the about the length and the beveling of the tube, can you explain this to the audience, please? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd like to make it a little bit pointy here because um, yes. I want to be able to be able to insert it through the, the scleral tunnel. I'm not aware of the length uh, being an issue. Uh, obviously, you don't want to put it too anterior, obviously. But when I enter, I enter at least uh, one and a half to two millimeters posterior to the limbus when I go in. So it's very rare for me ever to see the tube hit the, uh, the corneal endothelium. And I, from what I understand, the issue is not so much of the cornea and the tube being the chamber, but it affects the convection current in the anterior chamber. And that yeah. basically causes a local hypoxia to the endothelial cells. That can be an issue in patients, of course, with Fuchs or something like that. In that case, I may put the tube in the pars plano or behind the iris, in that behind case. I agree with, with this length of the tube, it doesn't matter, because the, actually the pupil is a little bit dilated. And in the yes. last follow-up, after the pupil getting it, this enormous size, the tube is very interesting at this length. It is away from the coronary endothelium. I yes. can't see it well. And all implants in the anterior chamber uh, will affect the number of the endothelial uh, cells. All of the implants all over the uh, world, uh, any implant will affect the endothelial cell count. But this lens is very acceptable and it doesn't uh, go to the open when the eye is normal, such like this photo to present. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's and, uh, and regarding it was the encapsulation uh, later on. At the end of your lecture, I have a case to present, inshallah. Okay. okay. Yeah, so Shikiri, you can go to the next presentation, please. Okay, yes. So let me just um, close out this one. And I'm going to, um, uh, let's see here. Uh, open up the next one. Give me one second here. Um, I need the to... next uh, presentation about uh, minimal invasive, yet maximally destructive, yes. a rule of uh, cataract surgery in uh, lowering the IOP. So let me... Um, Actually, this is a very interesting presentation. We, can you see that or no? no? No, not yet. Okay, so let me... Hmm. I opened it on my computer. I don't... Uh, Just share now? screen. Share oh. screen. Mohammed, Mohammed Eid, where you are, oh. Hatem Sen. <laughs> I offended. Uh, Does that work there? No, no, no. no. Okay. no. Go on, go on, yes. Dr. Steve. Yes, go on. So yes. This is an interesting case I uh, presented um, uh, at, in fact, all of the um, meetings, the American Glaucoma Society, ASCRS, and AAO, and I was fortunate that it received the award in uh, 2018 um, uh, for the best video, uh, and, I, and I thought it was very, uh, a, um, uh, an instructive uh, video. Uh, this is basically uh, deals with a patient who who presented uh, to me um, uh, with uh, the question basically comes in patients who are medically treated for glaucoma and they have control pressure they're on a lot of medications and they need cataract surgery do you have to do the cataract surgery with a glaucoma procedure in other words do you have to do it with a mixed procedure if they're controlled on medications and that's the basic question here so let me introduce you to the patient she's a very elderly woman very poor historian. She has multiple medical problems. She is on dialysis. She slumped in her chair. She's always nauseous. Uh, she's on Plavix for uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, she also has tardive dyskinesia. She has depression. And her daughter, who is a, a nurse, told me that, you know, my, my mom's vision is getting worse. Please do something. 
And you can see she's taking three, three glaucoma medications. She needs cataracts, right? Uh, she's pressures are obviously uh, not as ideal there in the mid to mid 20s. I didn't want to do too much because she's a very poor historian. It's hard for her to come to the hospital and she's very sick. So I said, you know, she could not even do a visual field test. So I planned that maybe we can, and this is the time now, of course, we'll see the dates here. I decided based on this study from Canada, that we'll do a cataract surgery and put two stents in. And according to this study by Belove, you can get at least a 20% reduction in pressure and 85% reduction in medications uh, for this. So I thought I just wanted to buy her time because she's a very sick woman. So this is her OCT and you know, it's not like she's at the end of the line. She has def diffused uh, uh, um, loss of fiber layer here. And so you can see here that the surgery and, and I want you to just pay careful attention. So I took her to the operating room and I always like doing my um, uh, MIG surgery at least for the stents before cataract. So this is uh, the video I'll play it here. You can see I am doing the neurotopical anesthesia. This is a flange on a, uh, a modified uh, Swan Jacob gonio lens. I'm putting it into the, uh, to the Schlem's canal, uh, but I didn't like it was too, I felt it was too superficial. So I wanted to regrasp it and to put it deeper. Uh, and you can make, pay attention to the iridotomy here. She has surgical iridotomy. Remember she has angle closure glaucoma. And while I'm getting ready to reinsert it, this is the beginning of the surgery suddenly you'll see that she has this sudden eye movement. And, and so this is obviously in slow motion here. And the tip of this eye stent grafts into the, into the uh, iridotomy and a bilateral tear causing a complete, uh, like a, a capsulotomy, a complete, um, uh, like a gat, removal of the entire iris for 360 degrees. So this is an iris explantation like a gat, um, and this is a very bad situation. So I said, well, I should just continue with the cataract. So I put in some viscoelastic, and um, fortunately the cataract surgery was very well, alhamdulillah. So, you know, that was my least of my worries. So I just uh, took care of this. I put the lens implant in, and, um, and I basically, I'm just hoping that I can, uh, if I can uh, tamponade and, and pressurize the globe, I can minimize the bleed. Remember, it's 360 tear here. And I'm, I'm really working hard to really hydrate and the stromal wounds so that when I'm coming, trying to come out, it's bleeding 360. Look at it, the blood is coming out. And that was a problem for me. But the cataract surgery went very well. And pay attention how well the lens is centered here. So now I put a viscodispersive just to coat the uh, and correct cut bleed. And I'm trying very quickly here to place the sutures um, so that I can really pressurize the globe. But as much as I'm trying to do that, you can see the wave of the blood is slowly coming. She's a very sick woman. Remember, she's on blood thinners. Uh, she's on Plavix, which is uh, we couldn't alter. She's a dialysis patient. And the blood is coming. It really made me concerned. So I injected more uh, uh, visco or dispersive here. But what made me sad was that the blood starts going behind the optic. And when it does that, you can see it's blocking the visual axis. So I'm hoping I can buy time with the high pressure and try to get her through the situation. And this is her story here. Without going crazy on the slide here, she had multiple visits over a span of four and a half months with a lot of problems, a lot of problems. And this is a summary of her uh, outcomes. And you can see during this duration of four and a half months, she had very poor vision of light perception to hand motion. Notice her pressure was from 10 to 76 millimeters of mercury. She had gone to the OR for at least four additional, uh, four operations after the original operation. We did an anterior chamber tap on her. She required multiple TPA injections because when I did a tube shunt surgery on her, we'll go over this real briefly. Uh, she had a clot in, and we also gave her Kenalog injections because she was not taking her post-op uh, steroid eye drops. She also ended up seeing internal medicine and also going to the emergency room on four visits. So she had a total of 15 interventions for this minimally invasive yet maximally destructive uh, outcome, which I did not expect here. And at four and a half months, she lost the eye. This is very hard for me, you know, uh, for being a glaucoma specialist. Uh, it really broke my heart, and, and we had to fit her with a prosthesis. But b besides all of these mon multiple visits to the uh, hospital and OR and so forth and, and procedures, let's not forget the cost of this. A lot more expensive than putting that small uh, device in the eye. So the question comes out, so here is her post-op care. At two to four weeks, you can see the high pressure, a pressure of 76 in a high FEMA. The lens implant is very nicely played. That was not the problem. And you can see carefully here, the blood that went behind the op, uh, optic is blocking her visual axis. I was hoping if I can buy time and do a YAG capsulotomy, I can make her at least happy. The tube is in good position, but like I said, we did an anterior chamber washout. I put a tube shunt in for this um, hyphema because the pressure was out of control, did an AC washout. And 
She, at three to four weeks, she had hemo in the tube. I had to give her TPA injections like the first case I showed you. And she basically was a non-compliant. So I gave her a sub uh, in, the, uh, in the inferior cul-de-sac Kenalog injections because she had a lot of inflammation. She was very poor um, in terms of care. Here she's at six weeks. You can see that she has a, almost a, uh, a, a shallow chamber. You can see the outline, the tube, is, uh, the, the, the IOL is well centered here. And on UBM, she had choroidals, and she underwent a choroidal drainage and had a tube tied by a retina colleague. And uh, this is tough now. In three to four months, she came in with a flat anterior chamber and what we define as malignant glaucoma. And at this point, the retina doctor did a vitrectomy, hyalidotomy, anterior chamber reformation. But unfortunately, because the tube kept on hitting the, the corneal endothelium because she's a poor, uh, non-compliant uh, patient, uh, she had corneal decompensation. There was discussion with our cornea colleague to do a corneal transplant, but unfortunately, she ended up having an enucleation at four and a half months because she was just someone who could not take care of herself. And at 10 months, she passed away. So this is a very important uh, lesson uh, and, and case I want to discuss with you, and I'll keep moving for the sake of time to discuss, uh, and we can try to answer the questions later, but I want to stay focused here. The question is, how could we have done better? Understand that before I did her procedure, I had done over 250 eye stem surgeries prior to this case. So this is from supposedly an expert um, who, who operated on her, and it was, a very, it was an adverse outcome. So some of the considerations could have been a block, but I don't like giving blocks or general anesthesia because she's on Plavix, she's very sick, so I don't think this was an option. We could have tried to use a fixation ring like the Vold uh, gonio lens or eye prism clip. I'm not sure if that would change anything. We could have done cataract surgery alone and continue her glaucoma medication. We would have been a, 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 an option to consider. Or we could have done the angle surgery after the cataract was taken out to give more space to work. But I don't think that would have been an issue either because she moved on uh, when I uh, was working on the beginning of the case. So when we think about MIGS procedures, I just want to put things in perspective. It's a very sexy term, right? MIGS. We have the hydrus, we have the eye stent inject, we have... Uh, the uh, canaloplasty, we have GAT, we have many, many procedures in this uh, uh, space, but it's reserved more for non-refractory glaucoma. There's minimal tissue alteration. In this case, she had maximal tissue alteration. I took her iris out. It's supposed to be a very high safety profile, but I don't think she was a candidate for this. And it's supposed to have some efficacy that's modest to moderate in lowering the intraocular pressure. So I looked at the literature and I found this nice report from the American Academy uh, by Chen et al. And he asked the question, what is the effect of cataract surgery alone on intraocular pressure in patients who are medically treated for glaucoma? Meaning they're gonna go undergo cataract surgery, they're medically controlled glaucoma patients, but they did not have any prior uh, glaucoma surgery. And so when you look at their literature, this is the summary, they looked at all of the publications in the literature and they categorized four different groups. The number of studies, the number of patients, and the follow-up. So if you have open angle glaucoma, they found nine studies, with over 460 uh, 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 subjects following you a year and a half, they found that you, if you just take the cataract out who are medically controlled, you get a 13% drop in intraocular pressure. If you have pseudo exfoliation, there are five studies here, and they went out to more than uh, um, you know, uh, two years, three years, they found a 20% drop out to 34 months. That's impressive. That's almost um, uh, 36 months there. But if you had chronic angle closure glaucoma, this is my take home message, and they, and they were medically treated, you'll get a 30% drop in, pressure, in uh, intraocular pressure and almost a 60% drop in uh, uh, dependence on medication. So this large drop may have to do with the uh, lack of access of aqueous to the outflow pathway to the trabecular meshwork. And it was also shown in this uh, study that those who are controlled on primary angle closure glaucoma patients it was rare for them at one year to require a filtration surgery. Another study looked at the combination of cataract surgery and glaucoma surgery, in this case, phacomorphic glaucoma, and they found that if you did cataract surgery alone, uh, and these patients have pressure of 36 to 40, okay, preoperatively, um, and they looked that if you did cataract surgery alone or cataract or trabeculectomy, at the six-month follow-up, they had a similar intraocular pressure drop of, to 12. Uh, remarkable. However, when you look at the visual acuity recovery three months, it was very poor in the trabeculectomy group, indicating that the, the, the glaucoma surgery was not necessary here. When they went out to six months, look at the visual acuity of, of more than 2040. 
more than half the people had a better visual outcome in the cataract surgery alone group versus those who had cataract and trabeculectomy. Again, pointing out that there's enhanced access to the trabecular meshwork outflow and that a faster visual recovery in those who underwent cataract surgery alone. The last point I wanna make here is about titration. Of course, there's a first generation eye stent, could be one, or you can put up to two or three of them. This study by Belove, which I indicated to earlier, whether you put two or three of these stents in, they get a 20% drop in pressure, whether it's two stents or three stents at one year out, and they get a drop in um, a reduction in medication burden by almost 75%. In our patient from the, from the last AAO study I showed you, they can get, in fact, a 30% drop, much better than putting in two stents, which I had initially planned, and 60% reduction in medications. So in summary here, um, in medically treated non-refractory glaucoma patients, you do not have to perform a combined cataract MIG surgery. The cataract surgery alone, especially in my angle closure patients, is enough. So what I do with the rare exceptions, when I have a patient come in who's medically treated with angle closure, I will perform the cataract surgery alone. That's what I would do. And the key here really is you have to select your patients. How old are they? What is their life expectancy? What core morbidities do they have? They have are there in plavix and heart disease and so forth? She also had a vein occlusion, as you saw, before considering um, MIGS. Nothing is 100% guaranteed. And so I want to I hope that you have learned from uh, my sharing with you uh, this complication. Uh, can I comment, uh, Dr. Skill? Oh, please. Hello? Hello? Yes. Yes, we hear yes. you, uh, Dr. Marrah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah. Of course, <laughs> this, this is a brief heart to, to represent <laughs> such like uh, this case. Uh, that is very, very um, uh, interesting case. Uh, I remember a patient since uh, six years, uh, he asked me um, to... Uh... Yeah, I can't hear you. Dr. Malah, any problem in the net with you? Uh, Dr. Ahmed, let me first of all congratulate Dr. Shakir for this excellent presentation. Yes. You are yes. a very modest um, person, uh, Dr. Shakir. You have exposed your uh, complication very clearly. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the, the best thing in the message itself to the doctors. Not yes. to be escaped from their own faults and to re re revise their, uh, their... It's a very complete and competent presentation, actually which leads to a very nice conclusion at the end, simple and clear message. Thank you for this really humble uh, message that you have exposed to us today. Dr. I Mahmoud, really like the, the presentation. Dr. Mahmoud, it is multiple dilemma in one presentation. Yes. What's, okay, okay. Actually, uh, Dr. Shakir, you, yani you have cleared a very good issue. What do you think, yeah, Dr. Magdibay? Magdi's uh, device. You're on mute, I think, Dr. Magdi. Un that... Unmute, yeah, Dr. Magdi. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, as you said, it's, it's it was a very interesting case, uh, and the uh, he, he was very uh, humble surgeon, and the message is clear. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shakil, for this one. Can, can we hear Dr. Malah? Dr. Malah? Dr. Malah? I think Dr. Malah didn't pay the internet bill. <laughs> 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 yeah. can, write, can write his comments maybe in the chat, maybe. Uh, with his name. <laughs> or, uh, Dr. Shakil, Dr. Shakil, until Dr. Malah is ready, please, a, a question could be, a, a, could be outside this dilemma. The simple question, if we that uh, we have a glaucoma patient with controlled IOP and he's cataract patient, you prefer to do cataract with glaucoma combined or cataract only in a controlled medical patient? Yes, that's what the paper showed, that if you do that, uh, you can actually um, um, 
Um, uh, please, uh, no, no, you're uh, outside from the paper and the studies, your experience and your... Yeah, so, so anybody with angle closure, I will do cataract only. Okay, okay. Because I'm expecting a 30% drop in pressure, which is... Yes, uh, yes, and, and, the the, ice and, the, right? and space for the angle. Yeah, and it's more for the eye stand. So there's no, for me, it makes no sense to do angle surgery yes. uh, when you can get a big drop from just the angle closure. Because even if they have glaucoma, I want to expose the aqueous to yes. the trabecular meshwork. It's been it's for a long time. Yes. But if they yes. open yes. angle glaucoma and they're on lots of medications and have issue with uh, compliance and so forth, then I might do something like a cataract or a tube or something that, that's appropriate for them. Uh, of course, it depends. What is the target? How bad is the glaucoma? Is it mild, moderate? If it's severe, obviously, I'll go for the for trabeculectomy. Yes, yes, yes. Another question this is the message that Dr. Shakir tried to tell us yes. at the end. In order not to lose vision, it's not only the pressure, Dr. Ahmed. Yes. The end, the message is, when you do combine glaucoma, and uh, if I understood right, Dr. Shakir, oh, if you do combine surgery, you will be almost the same in the intraocular pressure at the result, yes. doing or not doing the glaucoma filtering surgery, but definitely you will lose some vision. And that's why Dr. Shakir is getting us this message very clear and loud, actually. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, another question from the, our followers, is that uh, gonioscyclinolysis with cataract is better yes. for this uh, situation? Well, you know, I didn't get a chance to look at the angle, right? Because I had to take the cataract out and she was very sick. <laughs> if straight world case, you can go yeah. with cataract and uh, gonio yeah. So, So my next case will address that. My next case will address yeah. that. So anybody yeah. with angle closure, yeah. when it goes cataract, I always do gonioscopy intraoperatively. And if I see the angle is closed, I will do gonio lysis. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Malah, you, uh, you please uh, unmute and Malah. Uh, go uh, ahead and Malah, Malah, unmute. unmute yourself. Unmute your uh, phone, please. Unmute your Malah. Dr. Mohammed Eid, you can hear me? Yes, if I'm Dr. Malah, already co host, he, he can oh, unmute no. himself. Uh, no, no, you, you can tell him that you, he had to unmute himself. Okay. You cannot, you cannot hear us, please. And now for the last presentation for Dr. Shakil. You know, we are know you are fasting now, <laughs> waiting for your food. Uh, surgical management of acute angle closure in uh, specially case, special cases for ROP. Yeah, so let me uh, pull this one up here. Um, um, let's see here. Can you see the screen now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So this is also another interesting case that I wanted to share with you, and uh, which is really, there's no complication, but I think there's a lot of teaching points here that I'd like to share. Um, this, is, this is, the question is, you know, what do you do in someone who has acute angle closure and they also already have patent neurodotomies? It doesn't have to be ROP, and so this applies to anyone with acute angle closure. I want you to understand that. Does not, did this patient happen to have ROP, but uh, make it clear that anyone who comes in with angle closure high pressure, could be a patient in their 60s or 70s. This case will also apply, okay? So let's start over here and take a look at this. And so this is a, actually a very young uh, college graduate. She's deaf and mute. So the only means of her uh, functioning is her vision. She cannot really hear, she cannot really talk. She uses sign language. I never I met someone like her like this until I met her. And at 24, years, 24 weeks of life, she had a um, retinopathy of prematurity uh, for which she underwent uh, cryotherapy um, uh, in, the peripheral, um, um, in the periphery, and we can discuss it in a second. But when she presented to me, she had a mid-dilated non-reactive pupil, and in, in, despite having laser iridotomy in the left eye. She had eye pain, redness, she had blurred vision, and uh, her pressure was still 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury almost two weeks after the laser. I had to admit her to the hospital for almost about a couple of days because she was very sick. And you can see that she's on a lot of medications because she's deaf, she's mute. We had to admit her for observation and, and for treatment. COSOP, Alphagen, uh, she was on a you know, prostaglandin. She was on Diamox as well, uh, IV at that point. And so this is uh, the patient. This is her um, 
her uh, good right eye, you can see there's no iris bombay here. I'm sorry, this is the left eye. There's no iris bombay here in the left eye. And you can see that there are multiple iridotomies, so one at 12 o'clock, one at about two to three o'clock. And she, you can see she's, she's not doing very well. Pressure's 40, she's very sick. And so uh, this is a dilemma for me. And so you can see here on, on anterior segment OCT, both at the um, um, uh, temporal and nasal aspect, you can see the angle is completely closed, sealed shut. It's oppositionally closed despite having three patent um, iridotomies. And you can see here on her uh, um, measurements that she has very, uh, a, short, a short axial length of 21 millimeters of mercury, very steep keratometry. And so we diagnose her with phacomorphic glaucoma. It doesn't have to be the ROP, but anyone with phacomorphic glaucoma. Um, despite a patent iridotomy, she had elevated pressures in the 40s, short axial length, steep keratometry. And on UBM, she had no plateau iris, and we were unable to open the angle. So to answer the question from the previous case that someone asked in the chat, yes, the plan here is to do cataract surgery and possible gonia sneaky lysis because she's young. This is just only about... Uh, within a month of her iridotomy. So I don't think this is chronic and she's it's only 25 years old. So the challenges here in terms of surgical dilemma that I want to share with you are two. Number one, how to deal with the elevated uh, eye pressure. And number two, how to deal with the limited workspace because she has a shallow chamber. If I go do surgery, I don't want to cause damage to the corneal endothelium, right? So in terms of elevated intraocular pressure, um, how do you control the pressure before and uh, during the surgery? And the biggest concern I have with elevated eye pressure is iris herniation. Because if you're not careful, this positive pressure, if the iris comes out, it's going to be a long day. And it, it may, she may lose the eye, right? Because of positive pressure when you enter the chamber. In terms of the shallow chamber, we have limited workspace. How can we deepen that? And she also had cryotherapy at, 20, cryotherapy at a, a very young uh, gestational age of uh, just 24 weeks of life. And there was a concern that this may weaken her zonules and cause the lens to become more spherical and come anteriorly. And, and the whole iris lens diaphragm is basically closing the angle. And because it's more spherical, her anterior capsule is probably very, very lax, very, very you know, loose, right? We call it flaccid in English. And that'll be a challenge. And also she has a short axial length and being a female, she's at risk of aqueous misdirection. So some of the ways to, to tackle the elevated pressure I, I outlined here for you is to consider general anesthesia. And we know that general anesthesia can lower the intraocular pressure just by this, the use of the specific agents. They're known to do that. But what I do in these kind of patients, whoever presents with an acute rise in intraocular pressure uh, in the presence of a patent iridotomy, I will treat them with mannitol about, um, one, uh, uh, about 30 minutes before the surgery, one gram per kilogram, 20% solution. And I will treat them one hour before because we know that at 90 minutes, after giving the mannitol, she'll have a maximal drop in intraocular pressure. The other benefit of uh, mannitol is that it dehydrates the vitreous. So when you're shrinking the vitreous, it will secondarily deepen the anterior chamber and allow me as a surgeon to work in there. I would never use a malugan ring in an in, in a angle closure patient. That's the wrong device to use if you need to dilate the pupil. And three, I would use very long uh, side port incisions in the cornea so the iris will not come out. And I'll show that. So that's how I take care of the elevated pressure. In terms of the shallow chamber, I like treating these patients with atropine 48 hours before surgery, because as you know, atropine is a very powerful drug. Uh, it's a cycloplegic that deepens the anterior chamber. It, 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 it uh, posteriorly displaces the iris lens diaphragm. And by doing that, it stretches the, the zonules and it flattens the anterior capsule. So it's easier for me as a surgeon to handle it. It counters aqueous misdirection. It also stabilizes the blood aqueous barrier because that's what cycloplegics do. And so it will decrease the postoperative inflammation. Again, I would avoid, avoid using a malugan ring. I'll just use regular iris hooks like grease harbor hooks strategically if I need to dilate the pupil because it's a very bad idea in a crowded, narrow chamber to put in a ring that will destroy the endothelium, especially a young girl like her. Also, tripam blue, uh, I've learned, is also a very uh, important um, uh, agent. It decreases the elasticity of the anterior capsule and makes it easier for me to handle uh, during the capsular excess. And if there's anulopathy, I would consider using an AMED segment or a CTR, capsule tension ring, or iris hooks. So let's take a look at the video 
uh, which is very in instructional. And I'm going to stop along the way to make, point out certain things. Notice here in this video, I'm making long corneal incisions. They're very long. And the idea of making them long is that this will prevent the iris from herniating out. They're very long, so it's very uh, hard for the iris to come out. Then I will inject Tripan Blue to stain the anterior capsule because it reduces the elasticity and allows me to handle it uh, better. Then I'll inject something like Helon 5. And once you watch here closely, I'm actually going to, because the lens is spherical, I'm going to put a bolus of viscoelastic dead center to make the con, uh, 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 vexity more concave. So look very carefully here. I'll inject a bolus right there, if you see, of, of, of visco uh, uh, elastic there to uh, make it more concave. Uh, and then you can make as many side incisions as you want, no problem. I want a very controlled anterior chamber. And I want to use, you know, start very carefully with my capsule. You use MST, of course, of uh, uh, micro uh, um, for forceps or micro graspers here, and put as much viscoelastic as you want to maintain the chamber very carefully uh, to take your time to do it. And then I'll do a hydro dissection here. And, and what I'm going to basically do here, because the pressure is so elevated, I will use a bimanual approach in this case. Even if this person's 60 years old, I will try to debulk the mass. And I'm just doing a very careful bimanual IA. I'm always maintaining the chamber, uh, gently taking out the cataract. And I'll always will put in viscoelastic. And notice here, I'll put the viscoelastic in before I remove the, uh, the irrigation port. I'll always inject viscoelastic. I don't want this chamber to shallow. And I'm going to uh, fill up the, the bag with, uh, with uh, the appropriate uh, still cohesive. And then notice, only afterwards, after I do all of that, will I actually go and I will then make the keratoma incision again. Not before, because if you make the keratoma incision in the beginning, you're going to cause uh, the iris to herniate uh, and uh, through your temporal wound with a high pressure. So I would never do it until the very end. And then I'll inject, uh, it's a very subtle point. I'll always inject into the bag to make sure the bag is dilated. Right about here, you see, I'll inject here because I don't want this, uh, the bag to break. I'll put the lens in, let this settle out, and then we're going to do gonioscopy, intraoperative gonioscopy. And you can see here, I'm looking with the gonio lens. And look here, you will notice that the angle is completely closed here. It's completely closed. I'm going to just pause here for a second. And you can see here, it's zip shut. But remember, this is only two weeks when she presented. So this is a good candidate uh, for gonio And there are many, many instruments you can use. MST, you can use in your microutratas. You just want to gently grab and then gently pull uh, towards the center and not get too aggressive because you don't want to rip the iris or cause bleeding. And I will go quickly here, uh, speed it up here. You can see I'm doing the gonio sinicolysis very carefully, uh, nasally, and I'm going to inject more viscocohesive, and you can see the area here to keep the iris away from the cornea. And I actually went over her nasal bridge, believe it or not, uh, and I went nasally to temporal and did the same thing from over her nose. Because uh, I want to help this young child, right? She's a college graduate. She's a whole life ahead of her. And I did all of the glasses. And then what I'll do here as well with the visco cohesive, I'll, I'll inject to, to tampon out the bleed. And I'll go ahead and do it, uh, remove the viscoelastic from the bag. And then I'll inject more viscoelastic over just focally. And I'll do a blind glass at 12 and 6 o'clock because I cannot reset area uh, to um, help this patient, um, um, you know, have a ch fighting chance. And you can see here um, in the next slide that uh, with the new sneaky lights, this was her vision was 2070. She was on 30 to 40 pressured on maximal medical therapy on almost four or five meds. Look at the dramatic opening on the uh, um, OCT, how beautiful the angle opened up. And with the clear lens extraction, same thing we talked about in the last case, the shallow chamber is so deep. Her 2040 uh, at two months and she the pressure of 14. At one year out, she was 20, 30 with the pressure of 14 on no meds. And that's the take home message here. When someone presents with acute angle closure in the presence of a, a, a patent iridotomy, take the lens out because the problem, even if it's clear, the, path, the pathophysiology is the lens, remove it. It's rare for these patients, you know, a one year out to have to be on dependent on any uh, glaucoma medication and they have a very good prognosis in terms of uh, their visual outcome. And so the take home message here is that. You should use the same surgical rationale in anyone with chronic angle closure. Uh, they don't have to have glaucoma. Even if they do have glaucoma, just do the cataract surgery alone. 
and you need to understand what you're dealing with before you intervene. So if someone with acute angle closure, you want to control the pressure with mannitol, you want to give them uh, atropine to deepen the chamber and really have a systematic plan. And again, the biggest enemy during surgery is iris herniation and, um, and, and the concern for a, a limited workspace. I hope that this was a, a beneficial uh, case for you. Very nice presentation, Dr. Shakir. I have two questions for this uh, uh, entity. What is the possible cause of uh, closure angle coma in a case of ROP? What is the possible well, theology? Yes, because you know when in ROP, as you know, you have to do cryotherapy of the peripheral retina. And where do you yes. put the cryoprobe? Right outside the limbus. So if you're yes. treating for the peripheral retina, it probably weakened the ciliary body and the zonules and made the lens more spherical. So when yes. we cut more spherical, it caused the lens to push the iris diaphragm forward. And this was probably a slow form of angle closure that developed until she went to college. I did the yes. same operation in the other eye, by the way. Uh, yes. the same operation, but it wasn't acute because I was afraid she'll have the same problem there. But that's the yes. pathology here, that the ROP probably weakened the muscle and, and caused zonular laxity. This. Okay, the second question, the, with this management in ROP with angle closure glaucoma, could be also for a case of non uh, That's a good question. Uh, 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 that's a whole different creature. There you probably have to do some uh, scleral windows to uh, yes. prevent yes. scleral occlusions. But this is meant for more for a patient who's not necessarily that small eye, but anyone. I've had a couple of patients come who were over 65, a regular oh. patient who yes. had... Uh, you know, 22 millimeter axial length, but they had a hypermature cataract with a patent iridotomy, and this is a surgical approach uh, to take care of them. It's not just limited to ROP. Yes, okay. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, yes. Uh, last question, Bess. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mohammed al Basti from Cairo University. Okay. He would like to make a, a small comment. Can you unmute him, please? Dr. Okay. Mohammed al Basti. Dr. Mohamed Eid, could you uh, please can you, uh, from uh, unmute Dr. Al-Basti, Ustaz Al-Ramad in the Asr Al-Aini, who is a regular professor in glaucoma. He would like to make a I comment to Dr. Shakir, please. And I am taking it. Dr. Al-Basti, can you tell us about Dr. Mohamed? Can you tell us about Dr. Mohamed? Thank you, Dr. Shakir. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, see these uh, nice, difficult cases. I hope you hear me well. Yes, I yes, hear you. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, and Muhammad. thank you to Azhar Group. Uh, actually, I'm following your uh, webinars. All of them are very good and very successful. Thank you. Uh, I, I would just uh, make a comment. Uh, in, uh, our professors told us uh, in such cases, when you have the very narrow uh, anterior chamber, you can remove a piece of the, like making an iridectomy. Because doing synechulysis, I think, in such cases, we result back after a few weeks, maybe a few months, again, in inviting synechia due to the inflammation and the blood clotting at this. And she will not uh, lose a lot if you just make a small sector iridectomy in the upper area. Uh, I don't know what's your opinion, Dr. Shaquille, about uh, this. Yeah, again, I'm quoting the, uh, the paper that looked at uh, cataract surgery after laser iridotomy. It's from the American Academy of Ophthalmology in 2018. And I can share that with uh, Dr. Mazdi and uh, Dr. Almala. And they found that majority of these patients, the angle remained open. And also in this young woman, I don't want to do iridectomy. She's young, she, she's deaf and mute. I don't, I'm concerned about for potential for, you know, um, a prismatic effect and glare from if the irid iridectomy is too large. Um, I'm concerned about that. And, I, and um, what I did for her actually was I, I kept her on atropine for a good one month. So the atropine would keep the chamber deep. It would keep the iris away from the uh, angle. And, and, and since... In her case, the main cause of the angle closure was a, a spherical lens pushing the iris forward. And once I removed it, there was no more po po pos uh, posterior um, pressure pushing the iris. Her angle remained open at one year. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you for joining us, Torbasti, Kursan Taib. Another time, my deepest gratitude to Professor Dr. Shakir for his nice presentation and joining us, our other group. And uh, Dr. Shakir, uh, Ramadan Kareem, Dr. Malah, you want to say something? Excuse Are you me. Want? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Shakir, I'm so sorry for the interruption before. Uh, regarding to this case, I prefer after uh, one month or three months maximum, I can go to with a brief for an uh, argon laser iridoplast. Did you recommend? Uh, I think it's uh, an. Uh, yes. It, it, 
Yeah, I think it's indicated if the UBM is showing, um, you know, a suggestion of plateau iris or an ancillary body. It should not have that. <clears throat> So if, if there is a, 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 a anterior displacement body, I think it makes sense to do that. But I would not want to, again, subject her because she's deaf and mute in her case. But yes, that definitely is an option if the UBM preoperatively suggests that. You can do the cataract with the uh, even uh, endocycloplasty uh, you can do uh, if, if, you, if you have it. But I normally don't like doing erotoplasty unless there's a, a, a pathology to indicate it. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay. 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 Uh, regarding to the, the last the case before, yes, um, the, 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 I, I, I thank you very much for this brief heart to present such like case. And you remembered me by a patient who asked me to go to a uh, intravitreal injection since uh, six years and advised him, No, please uh, just do um, argo laser and wait a little for three to six months when you have a, a little of uh, macular edema. The patient, uh, his brother, take him to uh, one hospital and he did the intravitreal injection and he lost his eye. So mm -hmm. it, 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 it is muqaddar maktuf min from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but I mean, uh, I, I disagree for a mix with the tuberculosis. We didn't know how the patient can go on with me. Uh, number one, number two, um, regarding to the, the, um, the pelvix, pelvix, uh, the, uh, the, the patients, most of the elderly patients go on with them. Uh, actually, we, we can tell the patients, okay, don't worry, we continue on the pelvic and we take it easy. So after today, uh, I should uh, respect these plans and thank you very much for, for this interesting case. Uh, Dr. Mudassar raising his hand. Can, can you Dr. Mudassar. Dr. Um, if someone has angle closure and you just do cataract on them, I expect the angle to open. If the UBM or preoperative assessment, or even if you don't have a UBM, if you do the uh, gonioscopy and it doesn't show you a the double hump or sine wave to suggest um, plateau iris, I think just taking the cataract out would be more than sufficient. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And now thank we you. are uh, shifting now to my dear colleague, Professor, uh, Professor Tor Malah. A rising star in glaucoma surgery in Egypt and uh, worldwide. Yes. Uh, okay, I, we I can just, go. Okay. Yes, I just present to one case only for the time for uh, Dr. Sakil and okay. uh, we exhaust him so much. Okay. Uh, I represent uh, only one case. Um, uh, this is the video. Yes. <clears throat> share screen, Dr. Dr. Malah. Malah, share screen. Okay. Under. How? Do you This is share screen. Okay. Okay, you can see it now. Yes, yes, uh, yes. That's just the. Yes. Okay. You have to upload your presentation. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. To Muhammad, start. Okay, this time encapsulated the uh, uh, size of yes. I'm starting uh, to um, uh, you can see the video. Uh, yes, yes, okay, go on. Yes, and uh, this is a case of the uh, uh, FP7. And the patient comes uh, after uh, three months, uh, and this is the uh, inside the anterior uh, temple, and this is the encapsulation of uh, the blip. 
uh, this is uh, presenting a very big problem for us uh, for the cases where well, this was a uh, uh, glaucoma valve later on we have this is localized a uh, huge and large pleb encapsulated above the valve uh, the patient uh, its ip was a uh, 35 uh, and as you see i opened the conjunctiva tenens capsule carefully and bring all of this large encapsulation and uh, cautiously, I use this super blade uh, in parallel to the body of the valve, uh, just to open. And if you take a look well, you found the gush of the aqueous hammer uh, outside the, um, the, the this uh, very large encapsulation. You see me, Dr. Ahmed Salah? Yes, yes, okay. okay. Um, yes, okay. Okay. Uh, yes. And uh, as you see, this is, uh, Dr. Shakil, this is a very thick uh, membrane. Actually, during implantation, uh, I use uh, metromycin C regular, and also recently, for all cases, I use uh, also a sheet of um, uh, oligen uh, to put it above the valve. Uh, the valve is working very well, but this very uh, dense fibrous tissue it makes the operation uh, senseless. Uh, for my cases, actually, I didn't touch the tube. I didn't expand the valve. I just removed this dense membrane and testing the valve. And I found the aqueous, as you see, the aqueous is going out uh, very nice. But this problem is actually, we have it repeated in many cases uh, of Ahmed glaucoma valve. Um, as you see, this is the aqueous comes out, the tube is working, the valve is working, but this dense membrane makes a, a very big problem for us. Actually, as I said, I use metromycin C and I use uh, the uh, sheet of um, oligen, uh, one times 12 millimeter, to put it uh, uh, above the valve to decrease a little bit this fibrous reaction. Uh, you, you can see this is I have many cases like this um, and sometimes I just close the conj uh, but I am actually I'm fearing from the erosion of this conjunctiva later on from the body and from the if the patient is uh, make any um, itching for his eye uh, for my our colleagues they ask the tube this is a tube inside the the eye is more or less a, a little bit no long, but doesn't touch the endothelium and the valve working so much. This patient stayed for five years, have no problem after removal of this. But actually, uh, we um, when we have uh, the uh, this repeated problems, what can I do, Dr. Shakir, for your opinion? Uh, because I have many cases like such like this. Yeah, that that's a tough situation. I think it, you know, it's interesting that I don't know. Uh, I know that at least in the Middle East, compared to the states, you guys have a lot more uh, aggressive glaucoma and, and fibrous capsule uh, formation. Um, what has been your success rate with the uh, with the uh, this uh, cutting out this uh, encapsulated membrane? Was the pressure normalized? Does it what happens? Uh, after I remove this capsule, yeah. the pressure normalized. But uh, I mean, I, I faced it so many in my cases with very dear, this, this thick membrane under the conjunctival. It is very yeah. well encapsulated. And you what? see the valve is working and it's nice, but later on, um, mostly uh, after two or three years, I have this big encapsulation above the valve. So one of the studies showed that when you get encapsulation of the uh, Ahmed valve, post-operatively, I don't know if you're aware of the premise from Simon Law, it's an American Academy, I believe, uh, publication. Yeah. We recommend starting on aquisuppressants uh, if the pressure is above 17 millimeters of mercury, uh, immediately after post-op, so let's say one month. Yeah. Yes, 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 of course. But I yeah. mean, uh, if I found such like this mem dense membrane and I remove it and um, if it's repeated again, I mean, if there is no any new studies for that, I, I know that the world is going with next now, but I mean for kids. This is for kids, actually. Yeah, that, that's a tough situation. I know that they are now talking about doing even something like um, 
um, a Zen implant where they will actually place it above the tenons and underneath the cons. And some people, yes. I, I have to find the reference back and hopefully share it with you, uh, may have suggested placing the actual valve underneath the conjunctiva. I don't know if that's advisable with mitomycin C, but clearly you're going to have to look at other options if this is the outcome from the tube shunts for other surgeries. I know InFocus is another device that I'm waiting for it to come out. It's supposed to be as good as the uh, trabeculectomy with pressures in the you know, 12, 13 range for, for several years. So I think uh, uh, time will have to come. We're going to have to expand your options. But in a child, it's tough, obviously. It's, it's, that's a tough situation. I, um, I wouldn't do anything. I never understood why people would go and destroy this. Some people do this whole ECP stuff or micropulse. I, you know, glaucoma yeah. is not a disease yes. of, uh, of overproduction. Glaucoma is a problem of outflow. Uh, but this is a very yes. uh, challenging situation. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, you have many, many recurrent cases with this encapsulation of the Rahmat valve. What do you think yes. about the about the, uh, the pathology of this uh, this uh, encapsule? What I, is the cause? Actually, actually, we did the, the uh, analysis. Uh, uh, yeah, pathology. Pathology. Yes. Yes, and I found we just this just fibrous tissue and no, not this, nothing anymore. No, this not fibrous tissue. No, fibrous tissue. tissue. Not inflammatory tissue. Not inflammatory, yes, this fibers. And you see, it is so clear, white, uh, it is like, uh, like, looks the, like the scleral tissue. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so I, I face it many, many times. So sometimes I shift to the express, but the express trunk that's available in Egypt, it is yeah. for adults, not for kids. Yeah, yes. yeah. So would you use an F8, F, FP8 model? I saw you use a, a different model there. Yes. Oh, I use FP8 and the 7. Good, good. And the, the, the S2 and the S3 free for the adults. So, so have you tried the, uh, uh, the F, uh, FP7 in, uh, in children who are like five years old? That they, have you found that to be beneficial? Actually, I used both of them, but I, FP8 is more working than the FP7. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Turma, Turma Laha, a question for you from the, our audience or followers. Is it a theology implant? It is a media for in, in, uh, in, uh, introducing this capsule? No, I, after I remove this uh, capsule, I put the, uh, a, a sheet of collagen in the steel. Yes. You understand yes. me? No, no. no so I, no, I put no. it after I remove it. No, no, I, am, I, I mean... I remove the capsule, I put yes. the origin above the valve, no, no, under the conjunctive. I, I mean, I mean, origin implant in glaucoma surgery per se, without valve. Is there is any correlation yes. between capsule formation after origin implant or no relation? No, 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 no. No, no, no. relation, no, no relation. No very, relation. Uh, acting very well, uh, especially in, in cases such like this. Uh, did you have time to present another case, or that's enough uh, for the time of Dr. Shakil? Dr. Shakil, Dr. Shakil, uh, you are. Uh, okay. <laughs> if you have one more can, case, you can present. Sure. Can, can, you, can you stay with us for uh, a while, please? Or uh, or exhausted? No problem. No, no problem. I'm fine. Okay, we have. Um, we can have more. Uh, two, about ten minutes, to Mohammed. Yeah, you know, no, just uh, two minutes. Just two minutes. Two minutes. Until preparing to Malah uh, for your uh, next presentation, yes. there is a question to Shaquille. Yes. Uh, what is the what is the best procedure, surgical procedure for new vascular glaucoma? You comment. Yeah, I think that you know, if someone has uh, elevated pressure, you know, the studies have shown that that using the uh, Ahmed shunt is uh, is ideal because you want to get that pressure down. So I would recommend a uh, the FP7 for uh, new vascular glaucoma. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Malah, are you ready? Yes, Dr. Sakir, regarding to new vascular glaucoma, I, I prefer to, uh, and I, I, I do this study today, since one and a half year, I use uh, I, I, intracameral uh, anti-vision in combination with the laser cycle of uh, what, what type of anti-vision, Dr. Mohammed? Uh, the alpha percept. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 At the uh, time of uh, after uh, anti vision at the time of laser or before it? Uh, uh, no, uh, just one week before. One week. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, Mohammed, go on. Uh, this is 
this is a video for just uh, half a minute. Uh, as, uh, by the way, as Dr. Shatiri presents a case of uh, that we are, what we say to, and then we go on to get through. And this is so, 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 uh, I'm so lucky because I get so Hello, the video, you can see the video? Dr. Mohammed, the voice is not clear. Okay, I mean, I did FACO. Yes. A very okay. nice FACO, but I yes. use L. Yes. And after that, I go with Kahok dual plate. Yes. And just when it starts, I very gushed in my Hashima from the injection plastic. And I waited for 30 minutes, for, for one minute or two minutes to stop this hyphema. And I am finishing the surgery and I post glaucoma intervention for a second session. Okay. So I am so lucky because I catch the hyphema so early before the, I have a big problem. Thank you, Turmalah. Any question to Shakil or any comment? Yeah. To Shakil? Yeah, that's that's good. I think so. You need to be aware of uh, of your uh, surgical, um, you know, environment to uh, appropriately. You have to pay, pay attention. That's the message here. Pay attention. Yes. 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 To avoid complications. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Of course. Okay. Thank you very thank much, Dr. Mella. I repeat I my great, uh, great, uh, great uh, appreciation to Dr. Shakil to join us at this webinar today. My deep, uh, my deepest appreciation to my dear Professor Dr. Magdi Khalaf for preparing and organizing okay. this uh, glaucoma webinar today, joining with the, the Professor Dr. Mahmoud Ismail, to my colleague, my dear colleague, Professor Dr. Mohammed Malah, my deepest gratitude also to Mohammed Eid, to Hatim Sami, their effort, a great effort for preparing and still with us over this time. Uh, to Shakil, happy Ramadan. Uh, <laughs> you can. <laughs> At last, I want to thank my friend, Dr. Shakil, for joining us. Uh, we got a lot of uh, benefits from your cases and from your discussion. Uh, hopefully, we'll uh, repeat again uh, another time. Inshallah. Inshallah. And thanks to uh, my colleague, Professor Mahmoud Ismail, uh, Professor Ahmed Salah, and Professor Mohammed Al Mallah. Uh, good night. Thank you so much. Thank, so thank you. So yeah, thank you for having me. And, uh, yes, yes, yes. It's a great, great, honor, great honor to us, to Shakil. Okay. Maybe one day I'll visit Cairo and uh, visit your beautiful yeah, country. We are, yes, yes. We are, okay. waiting. we are waiting for this uh, visit. Soon, soon, inshallah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.